have three speakers scheduled to uh, talk about maybe, um, even though we don't know a lot about the beetle yet, um, and how to control the beetle or the fungus, we, we, can come up, we can begin to develop some strategies. And the first person to talk about strategies on how to deal with this problem is Tim Payne from the Department of Entomology. Okay, thank you very much. Um, after the first set of talks, um, the, all the message is not all doom and gloom. We, the result of this meeting is, has actually been really very, very productive, and we've got a sort of a roadmap of where to go. There's lots we don't know yet, and there's lots that we need to discover in order to effectively manage this beetle, but we, we've got a good roadmap, and I think we can be successful with this, with this effort. Um, you've seen lots of signs, uh, lots of photographs of symptoms of trees. The bleeding, the wet spots, um, the sugar volcanoes, all of those are very good signs of symptoms associated with infestation of this, of this uh, ambrosia beetle. Uh, I borrowed a lot of slides from Akif. He's, he's done a tremendous job photographing these. The wet spots, this, in a lot of places, this is how, in Israel and other parts of the world, this is how they quantify the levels of infestation, is just to go out and, and these, these signs are very obvious and, and easy to spot. Um, beneath the bark, you have the insect activity. One of the things that I think is important to, to keep clear is that just because an, the insect colonizes, attacks the tree, doesn't necessarily mean that that tree is a good host. This insect looks like it's tasting all sorts of different trees out in the landscape, out in the urban forest. Some of those trees are going to be good hosts. Some of them are not going to be good hosts. So you can see the sign, but unless you look under the bark, it's hard to know whether or not that's actually a good host. Um, in this case, you've got a, a small hole on the, on the bark, here, if you cut it open, you can see the signs of the, of the galleries underneath, and the, the larvae will be occupying those galleries. Now, I'm using, for shorthand, talking about the insect, but this isn't, isn't real, isn't realistic. What we're talking about is a symbiotic complex of a beetle and one or two or maybe three different fungi. It's not the fungus by itself, or the fungi by themselves. It's not the insect by, them, by itself. It's this symbiotic association that, that we need to, to keep in mind because it, it, it's that association that's interacting with the tree. And it's that association that the tree is responding to. And the successful reproduction of both the fungus and the insect depend on that interaction. So, Pardon me if I, if I talk about the insect, but we're dealing with this association and not just one organism. Okay, the other thing that, that is very important and it will be um, very, you'll see it when, we, when I talk about the insecticides, is that the, the larvae of this beetle, and, and Richard talked about this already, the larvae do not eat plants. They do not eat the wood. They eat the fungus that's associated with the beetle. So the adult excavates the galleries. They're actually consuming the wood. They're, they're using their mouth parts to excavate the galleries. They lay their eggs in the galleries. The larvae, when they hatch out from the eggs, begin to feed on the fungus. So, but they're not feeding on the plant material itself. So when, we, when I get to talking about the insecticides, we have to think about the way the insecticides move through the plant and what the insect and fungus complex is actually contacting. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I do want to make it clear that we're talking about a complex association and not, not individual organisms. Okay, one of the keys to management is knowing how this insect moves around. And there's two important ways that it moves. One is directed movement. It's flying 
from host to host. It's flying up and down the tree, trying to find a new place to, to bore in and initiate a new gallery and initiate a new reproductive event. So we have directed movement by the insect. We also have facilitated movement, and that's sort of a euphemism, but by that I mean people moving the insect around. For many wood borers, and, and the slides that Richard showed of, of detections of wood borers is a good example of how these insects move around. And they'll move around in, in finished packing material. That's one of the ways that they, they arrive in a new environment. They'll move around in firewood. And in many of the systems that I've worked with in the past, infested trees, whether they be infested with bark beetles or cerambicids or whatever, they get cut down as part of a sanitation effort, which is something that we want to see. But as soon as they hit the ground, they change composition. They go from dead tree to firewood resource. Something that can be sold, something that can be moved, something that, that people want to use. They put it in the back of their car, they put it in the back of a pickup truck, and they drive 50 or 60 miles to wherever they're going, and they stack it beside their house, or they stack it between two trees, and for some reason those trees die, and they wonder what in the world's going on. It's facilitated movement, and this is something that we really need your help with in terms of educating the folks that you come in contact with. Movement of infested wood material is, is the easiest way for this insect to move long distances. So. Um, if you have a chance, make sure that you, you tell your friends and neighbors and everybody else, don't move infested wood. All right. Um, fortunately, there's been a lot of work on, on this insect and in, in, in complex in other parts of the world, and we're, we're fortunate enough to piggyback on some of that work and, and, uh, and repeat it here in California. In some cases, we can launch off on some new directions. One of the things that becomes very important is knowing the movement of the insect, knowing the population levels, and that means knowing how to trap the insect. Those of you that have used pheromone traps before know that they can be very, very effective in monitoring populations. Knowing the right kind of trap to use can be very important. Um, there are a couple of them shown here. This is a a purple prism trap that's being used for emerald ash borer in various parts of the country. This is the Lindgren funnel trap, um, used for many scalidids, many bark beetles in, in, and ambrosia beetles in, in lots of parts of the world. They can be very effective if you have the right lure. Unfortunately, we don't have a good lure. The, in, in the southeast, with, with some ambrosia beetles, they can use manuka oil or ethanol. Um, many, many ambrosia beetles respond to ethanol because it's given off by dead or dying trees. It's a good signal to them as the right place to go. So far, the, the data for this beetle suggests that ethanol doesn't work very well. Neither does manuka oil, which is a, extracted from, I think, Brazilian walnut I heard today. So we need to look at an attractive lure, and this is something that that Richards is going to be looking at, um, looking at cut logs of, of known hosts. Maybe there's something there that we can exploit to, to improve our ability to trap these insects. Cultural control and sanitation. For many wood borers, this is the first line of management approaches trying to eliminate sources of infestation. That means removing infested trees so that they're not producing beetles that will infest new hosts. Removement, treatment of slash or logging residue or pruning residue. Um, there are lots of different ways of treating it. Burning it, burying it, chipping it, grinding it. All of these are, are possibilities, and, and one of the things, one of the approaches that we're going to be looking at is, is chipping and grinding. How, how fine do you have to grind or chip prunings or, or uh, cut material to prevent the insects from, from emerging, to kill the insects? And, and Tom Campbell is going to be giving a talk after this one, and he'll be talking about, uh, about the effectiveness of chipping with, with some other wood boring insects. An alternative approach in place is solarization. 
covering logs or infested material with, with plastic, either black or white or clear plastic, and putting it out in the sun and basically raising the temperature underneath the plastic to a point that's lethal to the insects that are on the inside. Um, this approach works in some places on some insects. We're going to, going to test it here in California and see whether it works for this ambrosia beetle. And then I already talked about firewood movement. This is a very important um, public relations effort and, and extension education effort that we need to be engaged in to limit, <coughs> excuse me, to limit the movement of infested material as firewood. Um, you, can, you can go to home and garden centers, you can go to, to um, roadsides and, and pick up firewood. Just be aware that this is something that, that we need to, to really carefully keep an eye on to, to limit the spread of the insect. Chemical control. Um, chemical control attempted um, by, by uh, our Israeli colleagues hasn't been as successful as we would like, would like it to be. Um, chemical control of, of scalitids has historically been a problem. Um, many of the bark beetles feed in the, in the cambium and phloem layers of, of infested hosts. Systemic insecticides have, have not worked all that well on, on bark beetles. And the main reason for this is that the systemics move in the xylem and the insects are feeding in the phloem. They're not getting contact with the material. So the systemics haven't worked all that well. The older systemics, let me be clear, the older systemics. So the Forest Service has been testing contact insecticides, bark treatments using some of the old carbamate materials and uh, pyrethroid materials. And some of them work really, really well. Basically, they form a chemical barrier on the outside of the tree, and as the beetles land on the tree, they contact the insecticide, and they're prevented from infesting the tree. So there are new materials. I guess the good news is there are some new materials, some new systemic materials that may, in fact, be very effective particularly for this beetle, because it is out in the xylem. It's not in the phloem. So it's going to be in the, in the stream where that insecticide is carried up through the wood of the tree. So that we may have a chance with some of the newer um, systemic insecticides. Combining those with a barrier spray on the main stem and the, the main scaffold branches may provide an approach to prevent or limit the infestations of new trees. The caveat and the thing to keep in mind is that these are not inexpensive. And so the value of the tree has to be balanced with the cost of the treatment. In some landscape environments where the trees are worth tens of thousands of dollars, an insecticide application may in fact be something that's, that is appropriate. In other places where you have large numbers of trees and the value of the individual tree is not all that great, maybe we need to look at some other approaches. But this is something that we're going to be looking at and hopefully within, on a short term, this is the, we're gonna be doing this in the very near future and hopefully we'll have some solutions that we can provide or some information we can provide um, to the clientele, user industry, the avocado industry and the landscape industry to um, put in the quiver. Okay, biological control. Biological control, the use of predators and parasitoids for control of wood borers. For most bark beetles, the amount of mortality can be attributed to natural enemies is about 25 to 35%. It's, it's not great. Um, most of these are for the the, the natural enemy bark beetle systems that are co-evolved in, in conifer forests in North America. It's possible that for this system we may see a shift of natural enemies onto this new borer. It may be that, that there are enough generalist natural enemies out there, um, we heard about lacewings, that might shift onto and, and provide some level of mortality. Um, there may be the possibility for 
doing exploration, if we can figure out where this beetle comes from, going to that environment and looking for natural enemies may be a possibility. It's not been tremendously successful in the past, but, but there is always that chance that we could find a natural enemy that works. Um, we learned in, in the last couple of days that, that in Australia, for example, um, the insect pathogenic fungus, Bovaria bassiana, actually is working, is, is very common in the galleries of this beetle and is very lethal to both larvae and adults. So there are commercial formulations of Bovaria, of this fungus, that can be applied, and it may be a solution that we can explore. So using the pathogenic fungi may be an approach that we can, we can exploit. Um, they tend to work much better in humid environments, and except for the last couple of days, I wouldn't consider this to be a humid environment, but, but it may be possible, and particularly with some of the new formulations. Um, one real long shot is the use of biological control agents to, to control the fungi. There are biological control programs for plant pathogens, and that may be something that, that uh, could be explored. So we need to look at this new complex, or this introduced complex of insects and fungi in a new environment. How does it differ here from other parts of the world? What's unique about our environment that may give us some opportunities for management that may not exist in other places? We can, as I said before, we can start with the experiences of others, the experiences with related species and the approaches that have been taken for other ambrosia beetles in other environments or, or even in, in in California, we have a number of ambrosia beetles, and then adapt them to the conditions that we see. Um, there are some long-term control strategies that we probably need to think about. Um, some of them were, have been mentioned already, and this is the idea of using cultural approaches, manipulating the environment, both through manipulation of watering regimes and fertilization regimes, cultural practices at the time of year when they would be less stressful or at a time of year when the beetles aren't as active. So there may be ways of using cultural approaches. Uh, Don mentioned, Don Hodel mentioned planting the right species in the right place. Um, this may be something that we need to think about um, on a long term. Maybe box elders, not a good street tree that we, maybe we need to think of alternatives to that as, as these trees are replaced. So we need to, to think about sort of short-term solutions and longer-term solutions depending on the particular environment, the particular use of those trees, and the resources that are available to manage those trees. So um, we have a long way to go. We have a lot to learn. And I think we're just, as, as Richard pointed out, we're just sort of four or five months into this. So we've got a long way to go. But, but I think that there are a lot of opportunities and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll have some better news in, in 12 months or so. So thank you very much.